Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 12 we read, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit, capital S Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Brothers and Christ, make sure you get your King James Bibles out and follow along. There's lots of scriptures we're going to be going over. I'm going to be turning to some of them physically, and some I will just be reading to you. You can pause the video and turn to the scriptures. Right? I'm just trying to keep these videos as, as short as possible, but lately, good, thorough studies take about an hour, sometimes two hours. Um, good Bible studies, I mean, for those who really love the Word of God. Um, so we're going to continue with our Are You Looking? Okay, the whole point of this is to remind the brethren what it means to look for that blessed hope. To be living a life looking for that blessed hope. We have men of God that used to be great men of God that loved the Word and, and everything, and they've turned from this. They've turned their back on this. Okay? And they're getting the brethren to turn their back on this. The whole point of this is to refresh you. Some of you go, when we go through the study, say, oh, I know that, oh, I know that. I know, but some, some brethren, it seems like they're forgetting. And when the scripture, it's they're forgetting the salva of thy salvation, God's salvation. They're forgetting the God of thy salvation is what the scripture says we're going get, to be getting into. This is a refresher. This is a reminder. Okay. We're going to go through the doctrine today of sin. Okay. We're going to talk about the condition of man, the consequences of that condition, and when did that condition come into the world? When did the laws of God get written on every man's heart? We're going to go back into this to refresh everyone's hearts to help us keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. He can come back any day now. Are you ready? Are you looking? Is your physical survival down here more important than your spiritual survival? Earning things down here, rewards down here, is rewards down here more important than rewards up there in heaven? Is your eyes on Jesus Christ or is your eyes on the world and looking in the mirror and your eyes are on yourself? Me, myself, and I. Right. The wages of sin is death. Okay, we're going to get into what a sin is, but first let's talk about the condition of man. Okay, Turn to Romans 3.23. Another good example of the condition of man is Romans 8. The condition of man is carnally minded and walking after the flesh. We just listened to that for the wages. Uh, if, you, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. What's the state of a lost person? They're carnally minded and walking after the flesh. The flesh is in charge. Someone who's saved is capital S spiritually minded, walking after the capital S spirit. Your life changes. But Romans 3.23 It says here, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. What's the state of man? The state of man is, is you're a sinner. Everyone at one point was a dirty, rotten, filthy, low down, no good sinner on their way to hell, deserving to go to hell for sinning against an almighty God, creator of all things, including us. We've sinned against them. And the consequences is hell. For all have sinned and come short of God. Now you say, after you're saved, you're no longer sinless. Uh, don't fall for that. Don't get into that heresy and that occult that's going around right now. That's You get saved, now you're sinlessly perfect. Anytime you're sin, it's not really sin, and, it's, and, and you can just do whatever you want. Don't fall for that. I am right? still a sinner, but I am a saved sinner that's going to heaven. I'm not going to hell anymore. Okay? I know about this wicked body of flesh and where to put it down. We did a study, Brother Says Christ, on putting on the whole armor of God. We always think it's so we can fight the enemy, we can fight the spiritual battle, Satan and everything. But it's also so we can fight this right here. Some people go like this. The flesh. And keep the flesh down if you're putting on the whole armor of God every day. If you're not putting on the whole armor of God, your flesh starts to come through. You start giving in to temptation, you start falling in. Uh, I say falling in. Say, so I had a brother correct me on that. You start falling for temptation... And letting it in and listening to that temptation, and then you choose to sin. And you start falling, your walk with the Lord starts falling apart. But for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay, go back to Romans 3.10. It reads, 
3.10 over here. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've all gone out of the way. They've together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their way. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. The way of peace have they not known. Remember the scripture that talks about what we were like before we got saved, brother says Christ? When we were in this sinful state and we were lost, we were on our way to hell, it says that we were without God. Because we're going to find out that sin separates us from God. We were without God and we were without hope in the world. Without God and without hope. I did not know what true peace was until I got truly saved and born again. The world's fake idea of peace is when you're pleasing this. The flesh. When you're pleasing this, the flesh. That's the world's idea of peace. But that's not God's idea of peace. God's idea of peace is everything around you that's... Let me say, be straightforward with this. If you sin, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. If you do things that are wrong, there's going to be consequences that are natural consequences to sin. Okay? And sometimes God will even, will, I always say this, God will step back and let you fall apart. And he'll come back and pick you back up as a saved sinner. Because if you go back to living like the world and looking like, you're going to be miserable. You're going to fall apart and you're going to be miserable if you're truly saved and born again and not a false convert. But I'm saying when the world is out of your hands, when the world around you is falling apart, God will give you peace during all that. Real peace. The fake peace when I was a false convert, when the world fell apart, my peace disappeared because it wasn't real. It was fake. It was counterfeit. It was all about pleasing the flesh. And when the flesh wasn't getting pleased anymore, that peace seemed to evaporate just like that. But when I truly got saved again, when the world's falling apart... God gives me peace. I stay in prayer. I read God's word. I sing hymns. God gives me peace. He gives us peace, brothers and sisters Christ. Real peace. The lost world, when I was lost, I did not know. And the way of peace have they not known. And when I was lost, they taught, told me in these Babel buildings that fearing Lord, I had a t-shirt that says, fear God, know God. That's all fearing God is, just knowing Him. Do you know who God is? Then, that, then you fear God if you know who God is. And the Bible says the devils also believe and tremble. They fear God. Fearing God is fearing God. You do wrong, you should have fear. If you start straying to the left and the right, where's the fear? You look at your sinful, wicked state and you become broken, it's the fear of the Lord. You know you're going to hell. You deserve to go to hell. God can send you to hell at any moment. You could die at any moment. God can send you to hell. And there's that fear. Lord, I don't want to go to hell. I am a sinner. I deserve to go to hell. Lord, I'm so sorry for my sins, for my wicked condition, for this fleshly condition that I'm in. I am so sorry, Lord. Please, please have mercy of me, a sinner. The fear of, of God, before there is no fear of God before their eyes. Remember what the Bible says, the fear of the, of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's how we find salvation when you start fearing God. The Bible says, fear God, honor the king. It says here, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Psalms 14.3, you don't have to turn here, but Psalms 14.3. They are all gone aside, they are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. That's what Paul meant when he says, as it is written. Referring back to the Old Testament. This is always how it's been, and we're going to get to when it started. But I want to get ahead of myself. Okay. John 9, you know, like I said, you can turn here, but John 9, 41. John 9, 41. Jesus said unto them, if you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. You have some people that get really prideful. They reject God. They reject God. They reject God. And their heart gets hardened. And their sin remaineth. Today, the big deception that's going on, I don't want to go into this too much, but the big deception going on today, um, the great, uh, you know, the great deception, if you want to say, is there's a lot of religious people out there that believe that they are going to go to heaven when they die. 
that sin can't be in heaven. Their sin remaineth. And they're going to get a big shock. Okay, When the catch and by of Christ happens, there's going to be so many people left behind that's going to be... They're going to believe that, oh, we were wrong about the catching away. We saw an event. It's, I believe it's going to be a big event. They saw the event, the catching away of the body of Christ, and they'll try to explain it away. But things are seems to be so easily forgotten. I mean, you read about what happened with the Jewish people coming out of Egypt, how easy they forgot everything that God did for them, all the miraculous miracles and signs and wonders, how quick and easy they forgot it and started putting their eyes on the world. I believe there's going to be a catching away. People are going to see it. It's a big event. It might get some people saved afterwards in the time of Jacob's trouble. You know, saints in the time of Jacob's trouble. But for the most part, I think a lot of them are going to just downplay it. And then afterwards, it's going to get forgotten really quick within a few years of the time of Jacob's trouble because it, all, all their eyes are going to be on this physical world and God's going to be pouring out His wrath on this physical world. It's going to be the worst time in the history of this, plan, of this planet that God created, Earth. It's going to be the greatest, hardest time ever and their eyes are going to be on that. And they're going to be distracted and they're going to forget it really quick. But their sin remaineth. Okay? There's only one way, and we're going to get to this in the next study of the next doctrine, which is going to be the doctrine of the gospel for today. Not the gospel from the past, not the gospel in the time of Jacob's trouble, not the gospel in the day of the Lord, the gospel for today. Okay? But what do you do? You need to get saved. But 1 John 1 8, reread. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. John 14, 6 says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father by me, but by me. When you have someone that says, I'm not a sinner, they don't have Jesus Christ in them. The Bible just says the truth is not in them. They don't have Jesus Christ in them. Mankind is a sinner. As long as we're in this wicked body of flesh, remember what we always I've te taught and a lot of other brethren have taught out there, we're two-thirds redeemed. When you get saved, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, your soul and your spirit are redeemed. But this wicked body of flesh isn't. We still have to deal with this wicked, wicked body of flesh. Right? Until we die, or until the catch away the body of Christ, when God does away with this wicked body of flesh and gives us an incorruptible body. The Bible says this mortal shall put on immortality, this corruption shall put on incorruption. Okay? But if you say today, present tense, I have no sin, then you don't have Jesus Christ in you. It says the truth is not in you. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, I will come with it to you and I will be with you. And then he talks about how God the Father is going to send the comfort of the Holy Spirit. In other words, you don't have the Holy Spirit in you. You say you have no sin, I I'm sinless. I'm sinlessly perfect. You see some people out there and part of these cults that are doing that, they don't have Jesus Christ in them. They don't have the Holy Spirit in them. Okay? First John 1 John 1.10 If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His Word is not in us. Once again, when you have people that downplay sin, Oh, sin's not that big of a deal, or I'm now sinlessly perfect, or something like that. The word They're not taking God's word and hiding it in their heart. I'm still a sinner, but, it's a sin, but I'm a man that struggles with sin. I'm a saved sinner. And the only reason I can struggle with sin and overcome sin in this life now is through the power of Jesus Christ. The Bible says I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And I remember, I'm going to say this, I remember Peter Rook in one of the studies, he was like, Could you still sin? And some of them, were, everyone's like, in the audience was like, yes, yes. And he's like, how do you explain that? Simple. When you sin, are you going through this? Or are you going through Jesus Christ? You're going through this. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. How do you overcome sin? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. You hide God's word in your heart. And Jesus is your strength. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He gets you going right. He gets you away from sin. He gets you living right. Okay. When you start going back to sin, or you let sin back into your life, it's because you're going through this body of flesh, not Jesus Christ. That's how you explain it. 
Right? And then that's what John 17, 17 was, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And in Psalms 119, 11 it says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We read about right? I just said. Sometimes I don't mention the address. Psalms 119. But the condition of man today, brothers, says Christ, is what? We're sinful and wicked. There's no getting around to it. We're born into a world where we grow up and where this body of flesh is always talking to us and tempting us. And as children growing up, when we get to the age of accountability, which we're not going to get into here because people like to argue over that, the age of accountability, you know what you're doing is wrong and you don't care and you choose to do it. Okay? I got to that point in my life. Okay? I, was, I, I realized before I got saved, I had to realize I was saved. But I knew even when I was lost that some of the things I did was wrong. Okay. I knew. And we're going to get into why I knew and how I knew. Okay. But the condition of man today is sin. We're sinful, wicked men and women. You're, that's just our state. Okay. The consequences of man's condition. So we're sinful, we're wicked. What's the consequences? Psalms 9, 17. A good one. Psalms 9, 17, we read, And the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations that forget God. The wicked, remember, we're sinful and we're wicked. And what's going to happen to sinful and wicked people? We go to hell. That's the consequences. Isaiah 5, 14, we read, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself, and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, pride, and their pride. And he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. The wicked world. Those who will not humble themselves and repent. The Bible says, unless ye all repent, ye shall likewise perish. Repentance has always been there from day one all the way to today. When it comes to God... Repentance has always been there. Mankind screwing up, getting into sin, getting into wickedness, going against God, and having to come back to Him in a humble, contrite state in repentance. But when you get people that are all pumped up and prideful, one of the things we, uh, you hear people teach about, Brother Jesus Christ, they say they go about in their own self-righteousness, self-righteousness. Well, you won't find that in the Bible. Okay, the Bible says they go about to establish their own righteousness. It's like trying to establish your in innocence in court. You can go about to establish it, but Brother Jesus Christ, I'm guilty. Are you a sinner? We're going to go to a court and you've got to establish your innocence. I'm guilty. And if you, and you go to court and you try to establish your innocence, you'll never be able to establish it. You're 100% guilty. The whole world is 100% guilty. Mankind are sin wicked sinners. Period. Okay? So that's why when the Bible says they go about to establish their righteousness, in other words, they're trying to have their own righteousness apart from God. And they fail every time, fall flat on their face every time. But we like to call it, the brethren like to call it self-righteousness, but that makes it like they have, they have succeeded. When you say they have their own self-righteousness, you're saying they've succeeded in having their own righteousness. No, the, the Bible says they go about to establish their own righteousness. But they fail every time. They're, they have no righteousness, period. Not even self-righteousness. They have no righteousness apart from God. Zero. Okay. They go to hell. Okay. Proverbs 16, 19, 18, we read about pomp. It says the pride that pride goeth before destruction and the high spirit before a fall. Most people get very prideful and they won't they harden their heart and they refuse to get saved. You can have brethren that start falling into pride and they start hardening their heart and they refuse to listen to anybody and they start making a mess of scripture and they start wronging the brethren. They start wronging the lost world, how they react and treat the lost world. They get very prideful, and it leads to the, the destruction. Their walk with the Lord can get destroyed. If they're a man in ministry, the ministry can get destroyed, become useless, worthless. Absolutely. Okay. But predominantly for what we're talking about when it comes to the lost world, they get so prideful and so propped up, I can go about establishing my own righteousness, 
Why? Because I'm getting ahead of myself, but the laws of God are written on their hearts and they think that, okay, I've got this as my template. Now I need to scratch that out and change this and move this over here. Now this is okay, but this is still not okay. And they get to go about being gods, their own gods, deciding what is good and what's not good. Okay? And they go about trying to establish their own righteousness. Some of them even think they've deceived God. But boy, will they be shocked when they stand before Him at the great white throne, Jesus Christ, who is God the Father manifest in the flesh. When we stand for Him at the great white throne being judged. Okay. Revelation 20, 15. Okay. And whosoever was not... Okay, and whosoever... Revelation 20, 15. I need to take breaks in between so you can turn there. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The book of life. How does one get in the book of life? Are you washed in the blood of Jesus Christ? Did you come to Him repenting? Repentance towards God, step one. Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, step two. Confess both in prayer, showing that you're not ashamed. And then the last step is you ask God. And the last two steps are done in prayer. You ask God to save you. And when God saves you, His blood is wa washes your sins away. And now Jesus Christ, who is perfect Lamb of God, who is perfect, His righteousness gets imputed to me, and I am now in the Lamb's book of life. And same thing goes for you, brothers and sisters of Christ. Don't forget what Jesus Christ did for us. Okay, some of you, we haven't got to that verse yet, but forgotten the God of thy salvation. You start going back into the world, you start getting messed up with the world, you start getting blinders on and focused on the world. It's all about physical survival, physical survival, and you take your eyes off Jesus Christ. You've forgotten the God of thy salvation. Don't forget what Jesus Christ did for us. But those who aren't written in the book of life, they're cast in the lake of fire. That's the end destination of everyone. Death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. Matthew 7, 23, we read, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Depart from me that you work iniquity. Iniquity is another word for sin. King David wrote in the Psalms that if I hold iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. You know why a lot of prayers don't get answered? Remember you have that, that teaching about thank God for unanswered prayers? God always knows what's best. And I always make sure to put in my prayers that God, despite of my requests, my prayer requests, your will be done, Lord. Your will be done. You know what you're doing. Whatever's going on in the world, you know what's going on. You have. You see the bigger picture. I don't. You're in charge. I am not. Lord, your will be done. Okay. But if you get back into wickedness and sin, you allow iniquity back into your heart, and you're holding on to a sin, and you won't let it go, that's, that's another reason why your prayers go unanswered. King David said himself, I hold iniquity in my heart. God will not hear me. Why will God not hear the prayers of the lost world? Because they're holding iniquity in their heart. Why will God sometimes ignore the prayers of saints? Because you're holding iniquity in your heart, brothers of Christ. You're not letting it go. But what's iniquity? It's another word for sin. Wickedness. Matthew 25, 41. Then shall he also... Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. We need to be saved from what? Sin. The cost of sin. The wages of sin is death. Right. The law of sin and death say you sin against God. State that if you sin against God, you go to hell and then to the, toss into the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. Now, you don't have to turn here, but Psalms 25, we're really close. Psalms 25. Brothers of Christ, I need to remind you, what do we do every day? There's times where I thank God almost every day for saving me. I have a hard time, my brain wanders, I start thinking of things I'm not supposed to, and then I have to snap back, get into prayer, get into singing some hymns, get into doing some physical work around here. Make sure I'm in those scriptures, listening to Alexander Scorvey as I work. Sometimes I spend time sitting out on the deck that's behind me. And listen to Alexander Scorvey. Uh, and I thank God. For what? For saving me. I don't deserve it. Even to this day, I still don't deserve it. I thank Him. Psalms 25. We will rejoice in thy salvation. 
And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. We rejoice in thy salvation. It's not my salvation, it's God's salvation. And you know what it means? I mean, you hear Brenner say that. You know what that truly means, Brother Says Christ? I belong to Jesus Christ. He's my commander-in-chief. He's capital L Lord, capital K King, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He commands, I obey. That's what it means when you say it's His salvation, not mine. And you've got some brethren out there trying to grab His salvation and say it's mine, and they're starting to do things their way, the world's way. The world as a whole, these false converts, false religions out there that claim Christianity, they do the same thing. I'm taking salvation, it's my salvation, and I'm going to make it the way I want to do it so I can live the life I want to live. If it's truly God's salvation, because it's not just words, one of our biggest problems in these last days, brothers and Christ, is it's hard online. Point at my computer. It's hard online to determine whether someone's all talk or if there's any walk that backs up their talk. Okay. If it's thy salvation, I belong to him. He commands through his word, and I obey. Stain from all appearance of evil. Put no wicked thing before thine eyes. Give God thanks in all things. Give him glory in all things. we got a lot of brethren lately that they're taking all the glory for themselves. I did this, I did that, and I accomplished this, and I did this for the brethren, and I did that. We're supposed to be giving God all the glory. Have you forgotten that Jesus is the God of thy salvation? Yeah, they have. When you start straying from this book, you have. Rejoice in thy salvation. Psalm 74. Let all those that seek thee rejoice. And be glad in thee, and let such as love thy salvation say continue, let God be magnified. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son. You magnify God. Your life is about magnifying God. Taking this book and holding it at such a high level in your life. It's your foundation. But such as love thy salvation? Yeah, it's not mine. It's God's. I belong to Him. I serve Him now. And sometimes there's a struggle and there's a war. That's what the whole armor of God is. There's a war between trying to serve Jesus Christ my Savior and this wicked body of flesh. Serving Jesus Christ my Savior and this wicked world. There's a war going on, brother. So that's the war that's going on. We can't change what's going on in the world as a whole. But we can do our best to be a light for Jesus Christ. Okay, there's two ways. I've said it before. There's two ways to witness for Jesus Christ. The life that you live and your words. You can just be all talk and no walk and people won't take you seriously. Or you can be walk and talk. And that's how you're supposed to be as a Christian. But lately we have a lot of talkers that don't walk the walk. And they, lead, they create false converts. They mislead people. They deceive people into thinking, oh, this is what Christianity is, according to the Bible. This is what true, the church of God, this is what it means to be you know, part of you know, God's family, brothers and sisters in Christ. No, it isn't. They, they see, oh, I can be saved and have the world. Oh, you can? Well, I, I, want, to sign, I want that. Sign me up. And they get deceived. Okay? No, we're supposed to be talk and walk. No. Getting saved means being set apart from this world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove, prove that's action, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, the life that you're living. Love not the world, neither things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Some, some brethren are getting so attached to things down here. And things down here are more important than the things up there. Rewards down here are more important than the rewards up there. Serving the flesh and serving the world, things down here, are more important than serving Jesus Christ and being a servant to the brethren. It's thy salvation, not mine. Psalm 79.9 Help us, help us, O God of our salvation. 
There you see R, O God of our salvation. It goes back to God. Okay? For the glory of thy name, and deliver us, and purge away your, our sins for thy name's sake. That's Psalm 79.9. Okay? But God's salvation, and when we say our salvation, we're saying it's God. He's the God of our salvation. He's the one that saved me. I serve Him. I'm pointing up because where's Jesus Christ right now? He's in heaven right now, preparing a place for us. And here we turn to Isaiah 17.10. Isaiah 17.10. Isaiah 17.10 Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation and has not been mindful of the rock of thy strength. I'm going to stop right there. Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation. Brothers and sisters of Christ, have you forgotten? Have you forgotten why you got saved? What kind of person you were before you were lost? Are you starting to go back to that person? Trying to resurrect the old man? Have you forgotten to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ? Because when you start trying to resurrect the old man, your eyes aren't on Jesus Christ. It's on this. It's on the world. Have you forgotten the God of thy salvation? Okay. Sin. The condition of man. The cost of sin. The condition of man is we're wicked, sinful people. And the cost of that sin being wicked and sinful is hell. But God provided a way. We'll get into that right now. God provided a way. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Okay. First Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, we're going to keep reading further than that. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also you have you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but you read the whole chapter. What's it talk about believing in vain? We did a study on this, brothers of Christ. How can someone believe in vain? It's up here. And there's no changed life. There's no resurrection. If you truly believe, you can believe the resurrection in words, or you can believe it with the life that you're living. If you truly believe Jesus Christ was raised the third day, then the old man is dead and buried with Jesus Christ, and the new man is also raised. You deny the new birth. You deny the new creature in Christ Jesus. You deny the changed life. You're denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what this chapter is saying. It gets into it. The Corinthians were carnally minded. Some of them were carnally minded, walking after the flesh. They were very wicked. They were very sinful. Paul's like, where's the changed life? If any man be in Christ. If a man be called a brother. If. If. I don't know. You guys are, I don't know if you're saved or not. I don't know. Some of you, I think, have believed in vain. There's no changed life. There's no resurrection. In your life, there's no new birth. Okay? Unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I received, how Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now stop right there. How many of you have been listening to some of the brethren lately, and you hear them say that, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, remember what it says, how Christ died according to the Scriptures, and how He was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. I've heard that a lot from a lot of the brethren. And you know what's very important? They're leaving out how that Jesus Christ died for our sins. They're leaving that part out. Why is that? Professing, Bible-believing preachers are leaving out, died for our sins. And sometimes I've caught myself saying, repeating what I've heard them saying, and sometimes it's just we're, you know, the poly want a cracker. You know, you're just repeating what someone else says. Okay. 
understand that. We got we got to fix that. When you start realizing that what that person is saying is wrong, we need to say it right. When you mention these verses, it has to be how that Christ died for our sins. There's where the repentance comes in. Because people always say, where's repentance in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4? Right there. How can you come to him saying that Jesus Christ died for my sins and yet you have no sorrow for your sins and you don't take sin? Sin's not a big deal. I love my sin. I'm, I have no problem with sin. How can you believe that Jesus truly died for your sins? You can't. It's just all up here and it's words. So you can be part of a club. So you can get that uh, free pass to heaven. You know, that insurance policy. So I can continue living how I want to live, sinful and wicked. And then I've got this insurance policy. I remember watching a video, I think it was on um, Martin Luther, but something, no it wasn't Martin Luther, it was um, John Wycliffe. There was a guy in there, it's like, I, I, he chose to sin, and they captured him, he was going to be beheaded, and because he was a wicked, wicked man, he's like, but I've got it all figured out. I've got an indulgence. He paid for an indulgence, okay? And that covers my sins, so I can continue sinning all I want. This is the Catholic Church, the Catholic core of Babylon, you know, the mother of harlots, Satan's church. And it's like, he thought he was going to get, you know, that he's going to heaven when he dies. He got, an, he got an insurance policy, you see, as it is. And that's what you got people out there. I got an insurance policy. They only say they believe because they want to be part of either that occult, that club, that Babel building. They want to please family members that are part of that cult, that Babel building. Or they want insurance policy. They, they want to deceive themselves in the back of their heads to say, hey, they, they've quenched the spirit that goes around and convicts all men. They've quenched their conscience and says, nope, I, I get to go to heaven when I die and I'm going to continue living how I want to live. And they don't, they ignore this part. It's just that Jesus died. I believe that Jesus died and rose again the third day. They always say that. I believe Jesus died and rose again. Do you believe Jesus died for your sins because of your wicked, filthy state? Is that why you believe? No, no. Oh, I'm not that bad of a person. I mean, yeah, I mean, I got sin. You got sin. We all, we're all sinners. How many of you heard that? Oh, yeah. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And it goes on in other verses that talk about how the death, uh, the new man, just as Christ was di died and was buried, so was the old man died and buried. And just as Christ was raised, the new man is raised. You're a new man if you're truly saved and born again. New man, new woman. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. All old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things. The way you live. You say, well, I'm still living in the same place. Yeah, but how you're living in that same place. How you view that same place. You used to probably complain. There's some people who used to complain. I wish I lived in a bigger place, a more expensive place. A place down by the beach where I can just, you know, the million dollar home. But then you get started, when you get saved, you're content with what God has given you. Your home goes from being a wicked home to a, what I call a Bible-believing, God-fearing home. You clean it up for the Lord. The Lord cleans it up. He commands, you obey. He cleans it up and makes it a Bible-believing, God-fearing home. Abstain from all appearance of evil, free home. Old man's dead and buried, new man's raised. All things become new. How you react to people, how you treat the lost world changes, how you treat... Now that you're part of a family, a real family, the body of Christ, how you treat one another. How you're there for one another. Prayer life starts. Bible reading life. Bible study. 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You start studying the word of God. You start reading it. You start hiding your heart. You start living it. It's a, you, you have a change. It's guaranteed. Anybody that tells you there's no changed life, there's no res they're saying there's no resurrection. They're denying the resurrection. Don't fall for that. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of about five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain until the present, but some are fallen asleep. Some have died. Fallen asleep has died. Sometimes in structure and righteous, there's some that have fallen away. They're not living for the Lord anymore. It's like they're dead again. 
dead in trespasses and sins. 7. After that he was seen of James and of the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. The Bible says before two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Uh, I think there was more than two or three witnesses that saw the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. I want to just throw that in there. We're going to go into that in more detail in the next study with, when we get into the, the true gospel for today. But today we're talking about sin. Okay, how Jesus Christ died for our sins. What's the state of man? We are sinful. We are wicked. What's the, what's the consequences? We're going to hell. What does that mean? We need to be saved. I don't want to go to hell. Do you, you guys didn't want to go to hell, brothers and sisters of Christ. We needed to be saved. Who saved us? Jesus Christ. God the Father, through His Son, capital S Son, Jesus Christ. Remember that said on the cross that it's God's blood that was shed on the cross? Feed the church of God, which He had purged with His own blood. But let's get back to sin. What is sin then? Okay, we know that the wicked state of man is sinful and wicked. The consequences is hell. We know we need to get saved. And the only way to save us is through Jesus Christ. Okay? But what is sin? Turn to Revelation 4.11. But before we can ask, what is sin, brother says Christ, ask yourself, what is the purpose of man? How many times you've heard theology uh, people and psychologists and, and the worldly, they're just, it's philosophical and the meaning of life and the purpose of mankind. Well, that's so simple. In two verses, we're going to go through three of them, but in two verses I can tell you, sum up the meaning of life. The purpose of man. Turn to Revelations 4.11. Revelations chapter 4, verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor. Glory and honor and power. Does God have the power in your life? I can do all things through Christ with strength me. Do you give God the power in your life or do you try to take it back? And live how you want to live. Get back, to, you know, trying to resurrect the old man or something. Are you honoring God with the life that you live? Are you giving God glory in all things? Are you taking credit for yourself? I did this and I did that. And it's all me, my own hands. I can save myself. You've forgotten the God of thy salvation? For thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. What's the purpose of man? Please, God. People say, well, if you end it right there, I'm telling you right now, we've, I've said this before myself, just to please God, that's, that's our job. Well, then people can start being, you can be as gods, knowing good and evil, and they get to decide what pleases God and what doesn't. You see how they try to take that away still and still do their own thing? Well, let's get into this a little bit further, okay? So the first step is this. We were created to please God. That's the purpose of man, to please God. Okay. Now, what pleases God? Turn to Proverbs 19.16. Proverbs 19.16. See if I got that right. Yes. Proverbs 19.16. Verse 19.16 says, He that keepeth the commandments keepeth his own soul. But he that despiseth his ways... I'll do it like this. He that despiseth his ways shall die. So we see here, He that keepeth the commandments keepeth his own soul. Why well, is man created? To please God. What pleases God? Keeping his commandments. You say, oh, no, that, that doesn't really say that. I know. But it says, he that keepeth, keepeth the commandments keepeth his own soul. Talking about God's commandments. But he that despises his ways shall die. And we're going to get into Cain and Abel here shortly. And Cain, God showed Cain his way, and Cain despised it. And what happened? He got cast out. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. It 
Sometimes I'm not good with the, the Old Testament. Esther. Right after Psalms and Proverbs. I keep telling myself this. Ecclesiastes 12.13 And this sums it up. We were created to please God. What's the purpose of man? To please God. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, we read, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. It's the whole duty of man. So how do we please God? By fearing Him and keeping His commandments. Okay. What is the Bible? I'm going to read some things to you about, just real quick about the fear. You can turn here if you like. Pause the video and turn. But there's a lot of scriptures I want to go over real quick. Fearing God, Job 28, 28. And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Notice how it tends to go hand in hand, fearing God and keeping His commandments. And by default, if you don't fear God, you're not going to keep His commandments. You're going to do things your way, the flesh's way, the world's way, by default. Psalms 111.10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. By default, if you fear the Lord, you're going to do His commandments. That's why the Bible says, by their fruits you shall know them. You can tell who fears the Lord by the life that they're living. And those who don't fear the Lord, the ones who keep God's commandments. Someone comes to me and says, hey, that thing you have in your house, I just want you to know this is where it comes from. It's very evil. It's very wicked. I get rid of it. Hey, what you're doing there is wrong. According to the scriptures, I look into the scriptures, I pray about it, look in the scriptures. You know what? That brother and sister in Christ was right. It gets out. I fear you, Lord. The fear of the Lord leads to keeping His commandments. When you find out that your life, your walk with the Lord is falling apart, it's because you're not fearing Him and you're not keeping His commandments. Proverbs 1.7 reads, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. There's the commandments of the Lord. Instruction. How to live your life. The do's and the don'ts. Proverbs 9.10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Mm -hmm. the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. You know what the word holy is? We did a study on this. That's why I got into a big disagreement with the brother in Christ that he, he, he stabbed me in the back and went his separate way over the word holy day versus holiday. Holiday, man-made. Holy day, God ordained. You know what holy means? It means the commandments of God. Jesus said, be ye holy as I am holy. Keep God's commandments, for they are holy. Holy, and, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Holy, being holy. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 15, 33. The fear of the Lord is, is instruction of wisdom. Instruction again. And before honor is humility. Humbling yourself before the Lord. Lord, lead me. Lord, tell me how to clean up my life. Yeah, you say first, but afterwards, Lord, you're in charge. Command me. Command me, O Lord. You're in charge. See how it goes hand in hand? The fear of the Lord and keeping His commandments go hand in hand. If someone's not keeping his commandments, they're not fearing the Lord. Isaiah 11, 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of, the counsel, of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. It's there. Isaiah 33, 6 we read. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of of salvation. The fear of the Lord is His treasure. The number one thing, if you hold on to, Lord, brother, says Christ, is the fear of the Lord. 
You fear the Lord. You fear Him. And you do your best to keep His commandments. When you stop fearing God and you start fearing this world, oh, it's about the flesh and I've got to survive. I've got to build up and survive for seven years. With this big thing that's going on in the, bo in the body of Christ online, oh, we've got to prep, prep, prep. You need to fear God and trust Him. He knows what He's doing. Once again, I'll say it again because I have to say it's no I, I do prep. I prep for about a year, year and a half. But that's the way we used to have to do it before the grocery stores and everything. I'm trying to do things the old ways where you try to stock up every year. You have planting season and harvest season. You jar things. You can things. And we've got electricity, so I freeze things. And it gets you through the whole year. And then you do it again. You stock up for a year. It gets you through the winter. Get you through the... That's how I live. That's how we're supposed to live. But this big push that you need to stock up for seven years... You know, like, what I call it, the, uh, you got to um, endure to the end to be caught up. Like this seven years of tribulation for true brethren that, that happens before the time of Jacob's trouble. The seven years, it's like, uh, it's chaos. I don't want to go into it too much, but uh, we're supposed to fear God and keep His commandments. And we're supposed to live for God. The mission today, brothers and Christ, doesn't change because of how bad and wicked the world is. It only gets stronger. The mission is supposed to get stronger. We're supposed to be a brighter light in this wicked world. The worst it gets out there, the brighter our light for Jesus Christ is supposed to shine through us. And the reason it's not is a lot of brethren are starting to fall away. And they're starting to conform to the world. They're starting to get scared about what's going on in the world. They're starting to fear the world. They're starting to fear the flesh. And they don't fear God. And when you don't fear God, what happens? You stop keeping His commandments. Now, what commandment is the most important for today? We read uh, um, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, but what's the, first, the most important commandment today? Romans 10, 16. So the reason you had to ask what, what the purpose of man was today... Romans 10, 16, was that we're to fear God and keep His commandments. That's what pleases Him, and for His pleasure we were and are created. We are and were created. Okay. Romans 10, 16, we read, <coughs> But they have not all obeyed the gospel. What's the most important command today, brothers and sisters in Christ? To obey the gospel, get saved. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all, all should come to repentance. Oh, repentance isn't part of salvation. You're dealing with a Satanist. You're dealing with someone who's on their way to hell. They want to go to hell, and they want you to go to hell with them. It's that simple. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. That's the gospel for today. How that Jesus Christ died for our sins. That's the gospel. Okay? How he died and buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, proving that he's God. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? They don't believe us. They chose the world and they choose the flesh over truly getting saved and born again. And today, like I said, the great deception, the, the, the guy's blinded the minds of them that believe not. He, he's blinded those that have hardened their heart, and they just say, oh, I'm a part of some religion. I believed. I didn't repent, and I didn't ask God to save me, but I believed. Their belief is in vain. Without repentance, you don't have real belief down here, and there's no changed life afterwards. It's evidence of salvation. They have not all obeyed the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 1.8, we read, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In flaming fire, they go to hell. It's serious. What's the number one command today? Obey the gospel. Get saved now. Not later. Not tomorrow. Not a year from now. Now. Now is the time of salvation, the Bible talks about. You need to get saved now. And we did, brothers and sisters Christ. Have you forgotten who it is that saved you and why you had needed to get saved? Have you forgotten who you were? 
the wicked man that was lost and on his way to hell without God in the world and without hope. That's the whole point of these videos. Are you looking for Jesus Christ with the life that you're living? Or are you slowly starting to go the way of the world and you're forgetting the God of thy salvation? 1 Peter 4.17 for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? <clears throat> what is the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? We read Psalms 9, 17, The wicked shall turn into hell, and all the nations that forget God. What's going to happen to them that obey not the gospel? They go to hell. So, like I said, brothers of Christ, we had to look to see what's the purpose of man. Why were we created? To please God. What pleases God? Fearing Him and keeping His commandments. And they go hand in hand. If you don't fear God, you don't keep His commandments. If you're keeping His commandments, it's because you fear God. Okay? Notice it says commandments plural. Not just one of them. Because some people can do one thing right, a few things right in their life. But their world as a whole, they're not living for Jesus Christ fully and completely. Right? But that's that. So what is sin? When you don't follow those commands. You don't fear God and you go against His commandments. That's where sin comes in. God says you're to do this, you don't do it, you're, you're now in sin. God says don't do this and you do it, you're now in sin. Why? Because you went against the commandments of God Almighty. That's what sin is. And this is what they hate right here. They hate a final authority that tells us what the do's and the don'ts are. What's the number one do? Obey the gospel. What's the number one thing that this commands us to do? Repent and believe. And ask, confess both in prayer and ask God to save us. That's the first and great commandment. Okay, for today. Okay. So what is sin? Let's look at sin in the Bible. When's the first time sin was mentioned? Genesis 4.1. Let's look at the first incidents, and then we're going to end up going back to Adam and Eve, because that's where it really goes back to. But Genesis 4.1. Let's look at the first time it's mentioned. Genesis 4.1. <clears throat> My throat's a little dry this morning. I was outside working around the chickens, so I apologize. Genesis 4.1. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she said, again, I mean, and she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground of, of an offering unto the Lord. Fruit of the ground. And Abel, as he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect to Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Why? Because you read in Hebrews, it says, Without the shedding of blood there can be no remission of sins. Throwing food up there, God doesn't care about it. Well, I'll, I'll throw a, a million dollar home on the, on the altar. God doesn't care about that. I will throw my expensive cars on the altar. God doesn't care about that. My planes, because <laughs> some people have their $20 million jets. These menace so-called on uh, TV evangelists. God doesn't care about that. God doesn't care about that. He cares about the, uh, there has to be blood that's be shed to cover your sins. Today, we have, he, the ultimate sacrifice, we have Jesus Christ that will actually take away our sins. But this is Old Testament. Old Testament, they had to have blood to cover their sins. That's why. And he explains it to Cain right here. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fell, fallen? Remember the Bible says that uh, where there is no law, there is no transgression. Cain thought he was doing something great for the Lord. God understood that. He was ignorant. God understood that. And God's like, Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? Do what Abel did. Do what is right. This is the right way to do it. That was the wrong way to do it. What you did was the wrong way to do it. This is the right way to do it. You've been shown the truth now. The do's, the don't. The do's, animal sacrifice, blood has to be shed, 
The food? No, it's not good enough. He's been shown. Will that not will thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. This is where we get the word sin again. Why? This is the commandment. Blood has to be shed. That's what pleases God. This is the do. He would he wouldn't do it. How do we know that? We keep going though, but sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Okay. He's telling Cain, this is the right way to do it. If you do the right thing, you'll be fine. But if you don't, sin lieth at the, at the door. If you continue the direction you're going, he was wroth. Bitterness. Hate. Anger. You continue down this road, it's going to lead to sin. Sin lieth at the door. You're going to end up going against my commandments. Okay? Now, I'm getting ahead of myself, but Adam and Eve, remember that when they ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they, that knowledge that they had got passed down to their sons. Okay? So what, how um, Cain reacted, he knew what he was doing was wrong, and he chose to sin against God. He knew murder is wrong. Okay? The cost of sin lying at the door. Keep going, Genesis 4.8, keep reading. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Murdered his, his brother. That's a sin. It goes against the laws of God that are written on every man's heart. I'm getting ahead of myself, but when we get to Adam and Eve, we're going to talk about when did the laws of God first get written on every man's heart? When Adam and Eve ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Cain had it on his heart. He knew what he was doing was wrong, and it, was, it went against the commandments of God. 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? See, one thing, when you read the Old, Old Testament, Brother Jesus Christ, we always think, when I was lost, false convert, professing to be saved in these Babel buildings, I always thought that the God of the Old Testament was different than the God of the New Testament. But if you actually read the Old Testament, there's some men whose hearts are so hardened that God will deal with them just right on the spot. But you listen to this, you're saying, when God says, where is Abel thy brother? You're saying God was ignorant? God didn't know Cain killed Abel. Yes, he did. He knew, and he was trying to give Cain a chance to repent. To confess and come forward and repent. Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, this is Cain, I know not. Am I, not, am I my brother's keeper? In other words, he hardened his heart. I'm not going to repent. And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hands. There's a cost to sin, brothers of Christ. There's a cost in this physical life to sin, and there's an eternal cost of sin. When you get saved, that eternal cost of sin gets paid. You're not going to hell when you die. But you still have to pay a physical price for sin in this life that you live. The Bible says, if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. That's for today. Okay? This is physical consequences to his actions and his sin. Okay? When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. Okay? A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And then Cain goes through and complains, you know, with worldly sorrow. Like I said, it's worldly sorrow because now there's punishment. God, I just want to throw this in there for repentance. Not that I don't want to go off too much on it. But there was worldly sorrow. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, worldly sorrow. I used the right one. It wasn't godly sorrow. God gave him a chance to repent. Where's Cain, my brother? He knew. He was given him a chance to repent. He wouldn't repent. So then God said, here's the punishment now. And now you look at him, and now he's, if you keep reading, he's all, I can't bear this, this is more than I can bear. And he now has worldly sorrow. He's sorry for the consequences, not for the action. He still killed Cain. If he didn't get caught, he'd still kill him again and again and again and again and again and again. You come across those types of people. And don't mistake him, worldly sorrow for godly sorrow. And there's a lot more examples in the Bible than just this, where God gives them a chance to repent, and they refuse to repent, and then he goes to punish them, and then they're like, oh, now I'm repenting. No, it's worldly sorrow. A good example is Jericho, the walls of Jericho. 
If you remember that with Joshua, in the book of Joshua, the walls of Jericho, there was a man that took spoil of Jericho that he wasn't supposed to touch anything. He took some gold and silver and, and some changes of raiments. He hid them under his tent. And when the Jews went out to fight, they failed because there, there was sin in the camp. And God was letting them know there's sin in the camp. And he tells Joshua to get up, and they start drawing lots. And then this group was pulled. Then they draw, draw lots again. And then this group out of that group was pulled. And it happened so many times. This man had so many opportunities to repent. God gave him so many opportunities to repent. When they failed the Lord and everybody was renting their clothes, he could have came forward and said, I had sinned against the Lord. I, I, I have failed the Lord. They drew lots. Okay, he's still in this. It's a bigger group, but they kept drawing lots to get it down to a smaller group until it came just to him. And then Joshua said, what have you done? And now he's like, hangs his head. Now that he's caught, he had all these opportunities to come forward. That's what I love about the Lord. He gives us opportunities to repent. Time and time again. He does. The God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament. Okay. But Cain hardened his heart. And the only time he was sorrowful was after his punishment was given to him. But sin lied at the door. What, what's that sin? He went against the commands of God. This is what the right way. Animal sacrifice. Food offering is the wrong way. And if you look at a lot of, don't get into it too much, but I've seen in a lot of false religions, there's a lot of food offerings to false gods. Okay? okay? That's not God's way. Now, we don't do animal sacrifices today. It's called rightly dividing, but in the Old Testament they did. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. We don't have to sacrifice uh, animals to cover, the, have that blood cover our sins. No. Jesus paid the price for me. He paid the price for you. But in the Old Testament, there was the animal sacrifices. Okay. Genesis 4.16, jump down to there, it says, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. We always say this, brothers Christ, when you start getting into wickedness and sin, it wrecks your walk with the Lord. Why? Because now you've gone out from the presence of the Lord to do that sin and enjoy that wicked sin that you've invited back into your life. I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit leaves you when you sin. I'm just talking about when it comes to your walk with the Lord. In the Old Testament, you went out from the presence of the Lord. Physical presence of the Lord. All right? In the New Te uh, Testament, what it's talking about, if we use this for instruction and righteousness, is your walk with the Lord falls apart. Why? Because you're not walking with the Lord. He's supposed to be leading. You're supposed to be following. He commands. You obey. You went off over here to do your own thing. Okay. What does sin do? It puts a wall between us and God, our Creator. Okay. Okay. Levit Leviticus 4.22. You don't have to turn here, but Leviticus 4.22. When a ruler hath sinned and done somewhat through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord his God concerning things which should not be done and is guilty. And you keep reading, there's a punishment afterwards. Okay. The commandments of the Lord, and it goes into a punishment. There is a punishment for sin, present tense, and eternally, like I said earlier. Present tense and eternally. Eternally, the consequences of sin is hell and then the lake of fire. But Jesus Christ saved us, brothers and Christ, from that. But physically, there's a cost to sin. The body starts falling apart quicker. Your life starts falling apart. You lose your peace. You lose your hope. You lose your joy. You lose your testimony. You lose things. You have hardship that you probably didn't, wouldn't have had if you'd have stayed on the straight and narrow. There's still some hardship you're going to go through, brothers in Christ, when you stay on the straight and narrow. But you'll, I look back in the hardest times in my life where I had no peace. That's the reason it was so hard. Probably wasn't the hardest time. If I look back, I went through harder times. But when I had the Lord and I was walking with the Lord, I had that peace that only God can give. But I, I look back at my hardest times and realize the reason I didn't have peace and they were the hardest times is because I was doing something wrong. I was deciding I was going to do things my way and I started going in a direction that God didn't want me to go. And I fell flat on my face so God can drag and pick me back up and get me back on the right path. All right. What is sin? Going against the commandments of God. Nehemiah 9.28, we read. And Nehemiah 9.28, or 29. 9.29 And testifieth against them that they might bring them again unto the law, if they dealt proudly and hearkened not unto thy commandments, but sinned against thy judgments. 
which if a man do, he shall live in them, and withdrew their shoulders and hardened their necks. That's what it means by to speak with a stiff neck. It means you're prideful. And that's how you're speaking. When, you, when you're prideful, you puff up and you step up and you have that neck up and you're speaking with a stiff neck. I will not turn back. I'm doing things my way and it's going to be my way. You have that air of arrogance about you. Oh yeah, I've seen it in the lost world and I've even seen it among some of the brethren. That stiff neck. I know what's right. And I'm going to do what I want to do. Yeah, speak with a stiff neck and would not hear. I've read these two things as example of what happened to Cain. He was told what to do, and he refused to do it. And all down throughout the Old Testament, you have the commandments of God that are written on every man's heart, and then it actually gets written down. Okay, Moses wrote, writes down all the Levitical laws, the do's and the don'ts. And he even writes them down in more detail, the do's and the don'ts. Okay. Romans 2.12 Romans 2.12 Romans chapter 2, verse 12. For as many have sinned without law, shall also perish without law. Saved. I'm a saved sinner. I'm not under the law of sin and death. I'm still under the law of sin in this life. We've talked about this in other studies. There's still a physical consequence for sin in this life. But I'm not under the law of sin and death. When I die, I'm under the law of God, of the Spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm under the law of the Spirit of life. That's what it's talking about. For as many have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many have sinned in the law, those who are lost are still under the law. People don't get that. You're still under the law if you're lost. The law of sin and death. As many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law, the great white throne. The book of life is going to be opened, and they're not going to be found in the book of life, and they're going to be shown all their sins and how they broke the commandments of God, the Levitical laws, the laws of God, His commandments. And then they're going to, be, they're going to fall on their knees and, and confess that Jesus is the Lord, capital L Lord, and then they're going to be cast into hell. Verse 13, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. What's the number one command today? Obey the gospel. 14. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Okay. Another way to look at this verse is to try to do the distinction between I did the distinction between saved and lost, but also the distinction between uh, the Gentiles and the Jews. The Jews, like I said, when Moses comes around, he actually writes everything down, the Levitical laws, the laws that are written on every man's heart. He writes them out and says, this is the do's, this is the don'ts. Right here, we got the Ten Commandments. Okay. Thou shalt not have other gods before me. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that take his name in vain. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against neighbor. And people just think these are the Ten Commandments. That's it. Well, if you actually know your Bible, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Okay? Moses writes down so many things. Right. One of the commandments in the uh, Old Testament is that a man is not to wear the apparel of women, and women are not to wear the apparel of men. And that does not just the Old Testament, that goes into the New Testament. But that's one of the Levitical laws. You won't find that there, but it's here. Okay. There's so many Levitical laws in there. Okay. So even though the Jews, have, God's chosen people, have written down the, a lot of the laws that are written on every man's heart, they've written them down. Paul's saying, but don't forget that those laws were written on every man's heart. So that's why the Gentiles, sometimes you'll catch the Gentiles saying, hey, this is murder, it's wrong. A good example of that is, I forgot where it was, but there was a tribe they went back to that didn't wasn't perverted by the rest of the world. It was like hidden from the world. And this is like, not today, the world as a whole has been perverted by everywhere has been perverted. But you go back like 100 years, and they were talking about how they did a, a incursion in there, and they talked with these tribesmen and these tribesmen are saying, yeah, murder's wrong. 
They weren't influenced by the rest of the world. They're like, yeah, murder's wrong. Yeah, you're not supposed to take another man's wife. That's wrong. Yeah, you're not supposed to do that. That's wrong. What is that? The laws of God are written on every man's heart, including Gentiles. And that's what Paul's saying, that God's laws are written on every man's heart. Every man's heart. What is sin? Going against the commandments of God. You're born with the laws of God written on your heart. And when you get to that age of, of, of accountability, what we call accountability, where you can discern those laws, this is right, that is wrong, that's when you start sinning against God. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. When you're an innocent, which we're going to get into with Adam and Eve, they were innocent at one point, there was no law, there was no transgression. But after they broke God's commandments, the law came in. Okay. The laws that were written on their heart. Galatians 3.22 The scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise of faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Okay. Galatians 3.24, jump down two verses, it says, Wherefore the law was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. We can't be justified by the law. The law says if you've sinned, you go to hell. Period. What is sin? Go breaking God's commandments. The law. That's what the law is in the Old Testament. It's not, I, don't, I had a brother in Christ and his pride, pompness, and his pride and his ego say it's just culture. It's just Jewish culture. It's just Jewish culture. No, they're God's laws through his chosen people, the Jewish people. It's God's laws. Sabbath day, it's God's commandment. Holy day, Sabbath day, new moon, it's God's commandments. In the Old Testament, do we have to keep those today? No. We've been told. That's a whole other discussion. But the whole point is, is it's not Jewish culture. Don't fall for that lie. It's God's commandments, God's laws through his people. Okay. And what are the laws for? Wherefore the laws were as our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Because we can't be justified by the law. Anyone who, like we just read there in Romans 2.12... If you sin uh, without the law, you'll perish without the law. When I tried to apply that for instruction and righteousness when it comes to saved and lost, okay? If you try to be justified by the law, you're going to die in the law. And, or you shall be judged by the law at the great white throne. Because you cannot go about, they're going about to establish their own righteousness. And you can't. What's the number one command today? Obey the gospel. Get saved. You need Jesus' righteousness. Your righteousness, you don't have any righteousness. You're going to be judged by the law. That's what the laws are in our hearts to bring us to Christ. When someone came to me and explained to me how filthy a wicked sinner I was, I knew that. But I was never taught the true plan of salvation until, eight, it's been eight years now? Eight years ago, I was taught the true plan of salvation. And I truly came to God broken and I, and I asked Him to save me and He saved me. As a false convert, I was still trying to be the best person I could be when I was around others, but they didn't know about some of the things I was doing in private. And I was still a very wicked person and very fleshly, flesh-driven, carnally minded. The laws were there in my heart the whole time. I knew some of the things I was doing was wrong. I knew it, but I didn't care. I went ahead and did them anyway. Now, now, I care. Why? Because I want to please God. And how do you please God? Fearing God and keeping His commandments. That's how you please our, your Creator. Romans 8, 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. There's a law of sin and death that came into the world. When did it come into the world? We're about to get into that. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 says, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. What is sin? Breaking God's commandments. When you go against God's commandments, you don't fear God, therefore you don't keep His commandments, and you get into sin. The laws of God are written on every man's heart. They know what's right, they know what's wrong, and when they've done wrong, they know that they're a sinner. Period. That's what sin is. Okay? When did sin come into the world? Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis. Genesis 2.9. We're going to be jumping around here a little bit, so 
Get ready to jump around. Okay. When did sin actually come into the world? When was the first time sin was in the world? We know when it was first mentioned with Cain. The word sin was mentioned with Cain. But when did sin actually first come into the world? Since we know what sin is now. Sin is going against God's commandments. God says, don't do this. You do it. You, you're now in sin. That's what sin is. It's going against God. God says, do this, and you won't do it. You're now in sin. You're going against God. Genesis 2, 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay. I had to do that because I wanted to explain what God created. <clears throat> he created all those things. Jump down to 16, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, the man, this was just Adam, this was before Eve was created, the man saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. There is the command. We always talk about this because this is the gospel in the Garden of Eden. You keep this one commandment, you will live forever. That's all they had to do was avoid that tree, stay away from that tree, and they would have lived forever. That's what was salvation back then. Okay? Don't believe that lie that the gospel has been the same all throughout the Bible from Genesis to, uh, to uh, uh, Revelation. That's a lie. That's a total lie. There was no repentance of sin, because there was no sin at that point. There was no repentance. And believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that he died for our sins, that we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Uh, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. That's not here. What was salvation here? There's the command, don't break it. That's what salvation is. It's works. Stay away from the tree. Don't, I don't eat of the fruit of the tree. I don't, don't, I, I mean, he didn't say stay away from it. He just said don't eat it. But personally, I'd stay away from it. You don't want that temptation. But we'll keep reading. Thou shalt surely die. 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. I only read that part because I wanted to say... Adam was created first, the command was given to Adam, Eve was created, then Adam passed that command on to Eve. Okay. He's a help me, okay? Eve, you're created for Adam. Listen to Adam, he'll tell you what, what, what you can do and what you can't do. The whole point of being here. Okay? Don't touch that. Uh, don't touch that. That's what she says. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Remember what the Bible says, Romans 6. Uh, we got to read um, chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. That's what it always comes down to. Yea, hath God says. Do you have, they try, Satan always tries to tempt you and the world tries to tempt you and your flesh tries to tempt you. And to not fearing God. And who's to say what God's real commandments are? I mean, who's to say what they are? Yea, hath God said. You know, you can decide what the commandments are. You can be your own God. That's what we're going to read in here. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it. God didn't say that. She added to God's word. Neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. When you start messing with God's word, that's how you get messed up. She started messing with God's word, and that's how she got messed up. Verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. He is called God a liar. For God doth know in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Ye can be as gods. You can be the one to be feared, and you can be the one that decides what the commandments are. And then the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the trees to desire to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. This is when the laws of God were written on every man's heart. And we're going to get to that part when they start having children. It says that they were made in Adam's image after his likeness. And we're going to talk about that. Verse 7. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron. Now they knew they were naked. Naked is a sin. 
But before, I didn't read this verse, but before it said that they were naked and they weren't ashamed because they didn't know. They didn't have the knowledge of good and evil. They didn't know being naked was a sin. They were innocent. Ignorant and innocent. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. It's the best example of it. Nakedness is a sin. But they were naked and weren't ashamed because they didn't know. After they ate of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, God's commands, do's, don'ts, they realized, hey, I'm naked and that's wrong. So they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid himself from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. God had a physical body walking through the Garden of Eden. You can't hide from God Almighty, the, the God the Father, which is the soul that's sitting on heaven. And you can't hide yourself from the Holy Spirit that's omnipresent and everywhere. What can you hide yourself from? We talked about this and the recent study that we did when we answered a, a sister in Christ's questions about did God have a physical body in the Old Testament. Yes, he did. They were hiding from a physical body walking in the garden. Okay? On the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard the voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Where have I commanded thee that thou should not eat? I commanded thee. What is sin? Going against the commandments of God. That's that simple. What is sin? Not fearing God and not keeping His commandments. That's what sin is. That's what the Bible teaches that sin is. And the number one fight today is, is who is the foundation for what the commandments of God are? The King James Bible is God's perfect written word. We've done plenty of studies. There's other brethren out there who've done plenty of studies. This is God's perfect written word. This is the commandment. Now you get to a second fight. What's the second fight? Rightly dividing, dispensational teaching. Making sure people aren't grabbing stuff from the Old Testament that don't apply to today. Grabbing from other dispensations, other time periods that don't apply to the, what we call the church age, but the Bible calls the time of the Gentiles. And you're not mixing things up. Today we don't do animal sacrifices. Like I said, today we don't have to keep the Sabbath day, holy days, and the new moon. Okay, uh, There are certain practices we don't have to do. Right? You don't cross the lines. There's lines that you don't bring stuff from one period, time period to another, and there's some things that do overlap. Right? But it says, I command thee that thou shouldst not eat. It's a command of God. They broke that command. That's the first sin in the Bible, actually. Even though sin isn't mentioned until Cain, the word sin, this is where the first sin command happened. They went against the command of God. And the man said... The woman who thou gave me to be with me, she gave me of the tree and did eat. Did Adam repent? No. He blamed everyone else. He blamed God, the woman that thou gavest me. Okay? She gave me of the tree and I did eat. So she, he blamed his wife and he blamed God. Then God goes to his wife. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is it that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. She blamed the serpent. It's not my fault, it's that serpent's fault. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Future prophecy, Jesus Christ. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow. Here's the consequences of breaking God's commandments. The consequences of sin. There's always consequences. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy count conception. And sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And thy desire shall be to thy husband. And he shall rule over thee. That's her punishment. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, I commanded thee to receive again. He broke the commandment of God. That's what sin is. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it the day, all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herbs of the field. 
people would say, well, why, how's that a punishment for today? Well, back then, they were keeping a garden and dressing it, but all the food was there. They didn't have to do anything. The food, their things just naturally grew. They've had fruit from trees. They, the food was there. They didn't have to work for it. Okay, they just had to dress and keep the garden for the Lord, but they didn't have to do what he's saying he's going to have to do for all eternity, what I'm doing now out in that garden. <clears throat> I work hardcore, and some years I work hardcore and get very little fruit and vegetables, and some years I get a lot. But it's always it's a toil, sweat, okay? Um, and verse 19, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till, thy, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken from the dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife Eve, because, he was, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. People say this is why they didn't die. The death that Jesus was taught, the, Jesus, I believe he was God, this is God manifest in the flesh walking in the garden. The death that he was talking about is spiritual. Now there's a physical cost. There's a physical cost to sin. But eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he was talking about spiritual death. And we're going to talk about this in just a second. But physically, something still had, blood had to be shed. Physically for the sin that they committed. And, and unto Adam and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Something had to die. Right? And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. And he drove out the man, and he placed him at the east of the Garden of Eden, cherubs and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So what happened? This is the first time sin came into the world, and what was the cost? Well, we saw some punishment that Eve had to face, and we saw some punishment that Adam had to face, but also one of the costs that we read here is now they didn't have access to the tree of life. So now, because sin is in the world, people grow old and die. That wasn't like that before. They had access to the tree of life. They were going to live forever as long as they kept God's commandments. But because sin came into the world, now people grow old and die. This whole body it grows old. And you have a peak part of your life, probably like in your 20s, where you feel like you're just so strong and invincible. But you get to be my age, and there's some brethren out there that are like 50, 60, 70 years old. And it's like you get to be our age, and you start realizing your body starts to fall apart. And that's the whole point. That's what sin does. This wicked, sinful body of flesh is going to fall apart. Someday it's going to get old. It's going gonna, it's gonna to get... Uh, uh, I love Peter Ruckman, but he's a good example. You watch his old videos, and you watch some of his newest videos right before he went to be with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The man shrunk. It looked like he's, when people get older, they tend to shrink a little bit. And the body falls apart. He gets old. His eyesight was getting worse. And, you know, he couldn't do the things he once could. And I've, I've seen elderly like that. But the whole point is sin enters the world. And now there's time as far as the body starts aging. There was time before, but I believe, but the body starts aging. We start getting old and we start dying. The body starts falling apart. The wages, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. The wages of sin is death. Okay. Now, how did the laws get written on every man's heart? Okay. Genesis 5.3. Jump over to Genesis 5.3. I keep talking about this. How did the laws get written on every man's heart? I believe when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the laws were written on their heart. And it gets passed down. Genesis 5.3. We read, and Adam lived a hundred and thirty years and begat a son in his own likeness and after his image and called his name Seth. This is after Cain and Abel. But called his name Seth. Before Adam's fall, I'm going to try to use some um, visuals. Before Adam's fall, I apologize for how long this is, but these are just... I, if I had a marker board, I did it on a marker board at one time, okay? These pins are showing connection. Okay. Let's see if it's in the mirror. Okay. Okay. This is Adam's uh, condition before the fall. Body, soul, spirit. 
everything's connected. I'll move this over here. Body, soul, spirit, it's all connected. Okay? They're in the presence of the Lord. They have fellowship with God. What happened after the fall? The body got tainted by sin, and because there's a connection here between body and soul, it tarnished the soul. What did it do? It severed this connection right here. Now you're, you have a spirit that keeps the body alive, but the spirit, your soul, you're spiritually dead. The Bible talks about being spiritually dead. So when it talks about in the likeness, and in his image, in his likeness, this is now the likeness. When Adam was made in the likeness of God, this is how it was. Body, soul, and spirit connected. When Jesus, God, manifest in the flesh, came in the likeness of sinful flesh, born of a virgin Mary, okay, when he came down here, he was like this. That's why he's called the second Adam. Completely connected, and he was perfect. No sin here to taint this. God the Father inside him, the soul. Jesus Christ is the body. The Holy Spirit is the spirit. They were all connected. That's why he's called the second Adam. Brothers of Christ, this is how we were before we were saved. I forget sometimes to turn that off. <laughs> But this was our condition before we got saved. This was our condition. What happens when we get saved? Um, first of all, it says right here, John, just real quick, John 6, 63 says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the spirit that quickeneth, the, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Talking about gospel, getting saved. This is our The flesh profiteth nothing. Like I said, all these all false, the wrong offerings aren't going to please God. All the good works and everything, because the laws of God are written on your heart, you can see the lost world, they will do things that are right sometimes. But that the flesh profiteth nothing. Why? Because you're spiritually dead. And right here, because of this connection right here, the flesh, even so much if one sin, will taint this soul, and now the soul is worthy of hell. It's that simple. Okay. First Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. It's the Spirit. Now this is the Spirit of man, but I'm talking about the Holy Spirit is what you need. What does the Holy Spirit do when God saves you? Romans 8.2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. We read that one before. Okay. If any man be in Christ, oh no, sorry. If, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Galatians 6, 8, we read, For he that soweth to his flesh shall reap corruption. Why? Because it taints the soul. But he that soweth to the spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes in, we're going to talk about it in just a second, shall uh, all of the spirit reap life everlasting. So what happens to us when we get saved, brother, sister, Christ? Colossians 2.11. Colossians 2.11. And whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of Jesus, or the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, the old man. This is the old man, brother, says Christ. Body, soul, you're spiritually dead. Therefore, the body's in charge. You're carnally minded, walking after the flesh. What happens when you get saved? You obey the gospel. You come to God broken for this state right here. If your soul and your body, for this wicked state, and you're spiritually dead. What happens when you come to get saved? And God saves you. The Holy Spirit comes in. Boom. This connection comes back. This connection, spiritual circumcision, I'm using this as a knife, spiritual cir circumcision, this connection disappears. But you have to be connected to a body. What's the new connection? I'll put the line right here if I can. You're not connected to Jesus Christ. He is your body. His righteousness now is imputed to your soul. 
When God looks at your soul now, he sees Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made on the cross. Now in your body, and now you're not carnally minded, walking after the flesh, the changed life. We just read that with the circumcision. Buried with him in baptism. The old man, this was connected, carnally minded, walking after the flesh. The new man, connected to God, to Jesus Christ. And because the Holy Spirit comes in, now you're spiritually alive. That connection comes back, and the Holy Spirit is in charge. Through the Holy Spirit, God opens this book to you and tells you, don't do that, do this, don't do that, do this, and cleans up your life. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Now, you still have to deal with this body of flesh. It tempts you sometime. But when now that you're saved, this is what people like to take advantage of. This isn't something to take advantage of. It's God's grace, and His saving grace. When your body sins now, it doesn't, tempt, it doesn't taint the soul. You still have to answer for sin in this life. We're still under the law of sin. We're just not under the law of sin and death. There's still consequences in this life for not living for Jesus Christ fully and completely. But this is our new, conne this is our new connection. Jesus Christ is now our body. That's why we're called the body of Christ. We have our soul and we have the Holy Spirit comes in and makes us spiritually alive. It's the Spirit that profiteth the flesh profiteth nothing. You have to get saved, brothers and sisters in Christ. You've got to get saved. Sorry for this. I just don't have my marker board because I did on the marker board in an old study where I was able to draw lines from body, soul, and spirit. And at the top I had God the Father is the soul, Jesus is the body, and the Holy Spirit is the spirit. And it shows this Holy Spirit comes in through what Jesus Christ did and connects us all. And the only thing that's not connected, like I said, we're two-thirds redeemed. Our soul and our body, or I mean soul and spirit, is redeemed and connected to God now. The body isn't. We're still waiting to be fully redeemed. We're not fully redeemed. Okay. That was Adam's condition, though, before he got saved. That was Jesus' condition when he came down. That's why he's called the second Adam. All three connected, body, soul, and spirit. And the body is perfect. Never tainted the soul so that his spirit, he was spiritually alive on birth. Now, how is man born? Man is born with the body and soul connected, and we're spiritually dead. That's how we're born into. We're born into a world where our flesh tries to dominate us, and it succeeds, and we're, we, we're not only capable of sin, we do sin against God. Okay? That's what sin is. Sin is going against, not fearing God and going against His commandments. And this flesh is always going to be against you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? That's the Bible doctrine, I believe, of what is sin. What is God? What's, what's our purpose? I'll go over again. What's our purpose? To please God. What pleases God? Fearing God and keeping His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. What's His commandment for today? Obey the gospel. I got saved because of my sins. Now that I'm saved, I don't want to sin against God anymore. I don't want to displease God. I want to fear God, and I want to keep his commandments. That's the new man, the new birth, the new creature in Christ Jesus. And how do we know what pleases God? His commandments, what his commandments are? Through his perfect written word, the King James Bible. For the lost, for the lost world, you like at some point we're like, you have to come to this knowledge that I'm a wicked sinner. I've sinned against God, God's commandments. I know what's right. God's laws are written on every man's heart. I know what's right, I know what's wrong. And I've done a lot of wrong things. I did some right things. But when you go to get saved, you don't focus on the right things. You focus 100% on the wrong things. The sin. I've sinned against God, period. Okay? You don't act like the publican and the... Uh, what was it? The uh, Pharisee and the publican where the Pharisee says, I'm not like other men are. I'm not this, I'm not that. He always mentions the things where he's doing right, and he tries to hide the things he's doing wrong. And I'm not as this publican. And the publican just beat his chest and said, God be merciful to me, sinner. He didn't focus on the things he did right. He was focusing on the things he did wrong. And he came to God broken. And brothers and sisters of Christ, hopefully that's how you came to the Lord, Jesus Christ. Broken, focusing on the sin. Saying, Lord, I am a sinner. I'm on my way to hell, and I deserve to go to hell. What is sin? I've broken your commandments. I've lied. 
Um, those are this. Some of you might have committed adultery. Some of you might have killed. Some of you might have stolen. Some of you might have lied, bared false witness. Okay. Some of you might have used the Lord's name in vain. Okay, some of you might have been part of false religions where you were going after false gods. Okay, you come to God broken as a sinner. That's the doctrine of sin. Sin is going against God's commandments. Right? So what does one do now? Okay, that's what we're going to get to the next study, brothers and Christ. What does one do now? Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You have to get to the point where you are miserable and you hate the life that you have, the wicked, sinful, wicked life that's apart from God. And only then, when you become broken, saying, I am a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner, on my way to hell, and I deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. I hate this life. I don't want this life. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Remember the, um, like we said, okay, the publican. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Wouldn't even lift up his eyes and look to, up to heaven. It just, down, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. You've got to understand what sin is, and you've got to come to that point. And then God's ready. To, then you're at a point where God can save you. So I'm going to leave this here, brothers of Christ. Are you looking for Jesus Christ? Have you forgotten the God of thy salvation? Have you forgotten who you were before you got saved? The old man. Are you starting to resurrect the old man? Are you starting to go back to doing things the world's way and not God's ways? Brothers and sisters of Christ, we're in the last days. A lot of us are falling. A lot of us are going doing things the world's way. I pray, I'm praying for the brethren every day. Lord, brother says Christ, pray for me. And Lord, I, I, pray, I was almost about to start praying and say, Lord, please watch over the brethren. Uh, brother says Christ, we need to be praying for one another in these last days. Brethren are falling away. Pride's coming in. Uh, envy, anger, bitterness, uh, covetousness, which is idolatry, sin. The people, try, uh, brethren trying to resurrect the old man, trying to forget the, who they were, why they got saved, who they were before they got saved, which leads to why they got saved, why they needed to get saved, who it was that saves them, saved them, and who it is they serve. Sin is still a big deal today, brother says Christ, even in the life of a saved sinner. Someone who's truly saved and born again, sin is a big deal to them. They don't want to sin. Their heart, they want to have a perfect heart with the Lord. That's what having a perfect heart with the Lord is, is your heartfelt desires. You don't want to sin against God. You fear Him, and you want to keep His commandments. Do you still fail the Lord sometimes? Absolutely. I do. But God gets me back up and gets me back going again. Why? Because my heartfelt desire is to please Him. Not this body of flesh. Not this wicked world. Not family members. Not co-workers. Not a respecter of persons. The man that's behind the, in the suit and tie behind the pulpit. Or the man behind the camera. My number one heartfelt desire is to please God through His perfect written word, the King James Bible. If you don't have a King James Bible, once again, email this ministry and we'll do our best to get you some King James Bibles. I've been helping some out. Praise the Lord. I'm shocked that more people didn't, would, aren't jumping on this to try to get some good Bibles. I try to get the good Bibles for people who want good Bibles. Um, but brother says Christ, we're in the last days. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Don't forget what sin is, and don't forget why you got saved. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video.